Today's sermon is entitled, Paul's Letter to the Philippians, Without Complaining or Arguing. The passage that I've chosen is chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. My name is Reverend Derek Gellert. I'm the pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say it's absolutely a beautiful day outside. So I hope and pray as you're listening to this sermon that you can feel the warmth of God flowing within your heart, and you're willing to bow your knee to him. We're going to learn an awful lot about the way that we relate to one another in this sermon, and I hope it's of great benefit to you. It certainly is for me. I can tell you that. This is a beautiful section that Paul writes to Philippi. I got thinking, you know what? The reality is, is that we all have to go through difficult times. Nobody ever gets a free, I, I guess, a free life or a free, free uh, journey through life where they don't have to go through difficulties. Everybody does. The Bible warns us that life is not going to be easy. The sun and the rain of blessings falls both on the righteous and the unrighteous, Matthew 5.45. Ecclesiastes, when Solomon spoke to the people, remember the, the fellow that was so incredibly wise, the wisest man that ever walked except for Jesus Christ himself, said this, chance happens to everyone. Bad things happen to both good and bad people alike. And often you cannot control those circumstances that are coming your way. And then the Lord says this, he says to the believers, he says, if they hated you, hated me, they're going to hate you too as well. If they persecuted me and put me on a cross, they're going to persecute you too. Be ready for it. Understand it. Understand the closer they get to the light, the more they're going to not like the light because it reveals the darkness in them. And the more you tell them about the Lord, the more they're going to persecute you. You know what? The reality is we go through all sorts of things in life, and some of them are really good things, aren't they? There's some things that we go through in life that we sit back and say, you know what, this is pleasant, this is wonderful, I like this. Like, you know, the birth of a first child, or when you get married, or, you know, a really good supper, or, you know, an event that you go to. There's lots of things in life that we get to have that are a lot of fun. They're very enjoyable. But there's other circumstances of life that are very negative that we have to go through. It could be, you know, financial problems. It could be a divorce. It could be, you know, an ailment that you have that's ongoing and you're wondering if you're going to live. There's lots of things that we go through in life that aren't, aren't pleasant at all. And those negative circumstances, the Bible says, often they're beyond our control. In other words, we never did anything to deserve them, but at the same time, we're still going through them. Some of the nicest and most wonderful people in the world go through difficult times, and that's a reality. When we get bad times that come to us, the question is, how do we handle them? Vividly, a lot of people will explain their circumstances to other people. I think there's something to be said about seeking the comfort of somebody else. We often go to other people and say, you know what, this is what I'm going through. And we, ex we explain to them, this is what I feel like right now when I'm going through this difficult time. In other words, this is what I feel like when I'm going through this ailment. And this is what it makes me feel. I feel scared. I'm nervous. I'm, I'm starting to think about my own mortality. And we tell them all about it. There are many reasons why ultimately we do this. I think one of them is comfort, but at the same time, there must be a point where it goes beyond that, where we're trying to say something to somebody, this is what I'm going through, and in our minds, I think we're kind of hoping, maybe you'll tell me about your circumstances or somebody else's that's far worse. Therefore, I'm going to feel a little bit better about my own bad times. Whatever the reason why we tell other people about our hardships makes no difference in the end. It's actually to find comfort. It can be a really good thing. It's not a sin. However, is there a point where it does become a sin? You know, complaining really is taking our negative circumstances or taking our circumstances in general, finding the negative in them and telling everybody about them over and over and over again. Yes, it can have great therapeutic value, and if you're looking for another believer to lift you up, that's not a sin. But at the point where it becomes something that you're just telling everybody else about, and you're complaining about it, and you're bitter about it, and you're angry about it, that's completely different. I got thinking, you know, the world would say, you know what, is it okay to tell other people about your difficulties? Is it much better not, isn't it much better not to tell them all about how rough your life is rather than when somebody asks you, how's it going? Smiling and giving them platitude like, oh, it's okay. Everything's good. Yep. Wink, wink. You know, is it okay to lie to people and tell them, you know what? I feel great when you actually don't feel so good at all. What is wrong with describing your difficult times to other people if it's a coping mechanism for you? And the Bible says, I understand all of that. But the reality is this, complaining to somebody else can actually be a sin. 
And I think it is in most circumstances because it's no longer seeking comfort. It's actually saying, I'm not happy with my circumstances. I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm mad. I want to tell everybody about it, not to get comfort, not to hear the words of God flow within my soul. I just want to tell everybody about it because I'm not happy. That's complaints. And the Bible says that's not what we're supposed to do as Christians. Does not complaining ultimately affect our witness to the world? How can we go to the world and tell them about unspeakable grace and joy within our lives? And if they only came to know Jesus, then they would love him so very much and they're going to be filled with joy. And at the same time, we're complaining about every little thing in our lives. How can we get a good witness that way? In today's passage, Paul says this. He says, do everything without complaining, grumbling, and arguing. Do everything without doing that. In other words, take that vocabulary that you have, complaining, and take it out of your vocabulary. Don't use it. Paul's not saying there's there's something wrong with seeking comfort from another person. He's not saying that. That's okay to do. But when we start telling everybody about our negative circumstances, just to complain and vent our anger and frustration, Paul says, avoid that at all cost. As we as I go through the sermon, here's what I want you to do. Ask yourself, am I really satisfied with the blessings I've received from God, especially considering the fact that someday I'm going home to be with him? Are you satisfied with that? Is that enough for you? If the Lord says, I want you to go through negative circumstances, in other words, are you okay going through those circumstances, knowing that you might suffer for a little while, Paul says, but later on you're going to get glory that far out exceeds exceeds any kind of suffering you've ever done in your life. Are you okay with that? And as I go through, keep asking yourself that question. Are you okay with what the Lord has given to you? whether it might be good or whether he might allow bad things to happen in your life. Are you okay with it? Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill his good purpose. This is a beautiful hymn that we just went through in last week's sermon. If you missed it, you can go back in and listen to it. But he just read this beautiful hymn. Christ got on the cross and he died for each and every one of us. He humbled himself and became a servant. Everybody in heaven knew exactly who he was. He came to the earth. Nobody knew his identity, his divine identity. And in the end, put him on a cross and executed him. But he chose to do so because he loves us, each and every one of us. Paul doesn't, Paul says, you know what? I am going to eventually die. I'm probably not going to make it out of this prison cell. And Paul doesn't leave the Philippians with, with an idea in their head, like, well, how are they supposed to respond to that? Think about your own pastor. If your own pastor was to die tomorrow, how would you respond to it? Maybe you'd be angry. Maybe you'd be bitter. Maybe you'd be disappointed with God. But you know what, Paul says, I don't want you to to be left on your own to think about the way in which you should respond to my death if it does happen. Paul says, this is what I want you to do. I want to tell you exactly how I want you to handle my death. I I, I want you to know how I see my death and how I want you to see it. You know, as you obeyed in my absence, in my presence, I want you to obey in my absence, Paul says, first and foremost. He says, work out your salvation with much fear and trembling. This verse, of course, is much debated when Paul starts off this section. He says, you know what, the reality is, is that it should something happen to me, I want you to continue working out this salvation. But it has two dimensions to it. And I think this is where the confusion, most commentators will pick one dimension or another dimension of the interpretation of this verse, but I actually prefer both of them. This verse is debated, but it doesn't need to be. First, at the foot of the cross, each individual is responsible to spiritually grow in the faith and become mature. The work of atonement is already done. In other words, we can't earn our salvation. We can't do a whole bunch of good deeds and say, there you go, Lord, I've paid enough now. Surely I'm saved. It doesn't work that way. Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And as a result of that, we have the opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for us, and we become saved through our belief and by his atoning sacrifice. That's the only way we become saved. So first and foremost, the work of atonement's already done, but that doesn't mean that we're done doing things for the Lord. You know, when we work at our salvation, we're not supposed to grovel before the Lord as a slave before his master. 
In Proverbs, it says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. I do think we should fear the Lord to a certain extent. I do think there's something to be said in Hebrews that talks about it, about us fearing or at least taking into consideration all of our actions. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Is the Lord capable of giving us all sorts of different kinds of punishments? Absolutely, of course he is. And should we fear that somewhat? Yes, we certainly should. Not as a person looking at God and say, you're an angry God or a wicked sinner. God's always just in whatever he gives us. But ultimately, we've got to look at the Bible and say, we've got to take this seriously because God could punish us. That's part of it. But the other part of it is, is that we shouldn't be terrified of God the Father in heaven. It says in the Bible, we should approach his throne of grace with great boldness because he always offers grace and mercy. We should live in reverence to God, in other words, fully submissive, always to his will. And and God's going to discipline us if we fall out of line sometimes, but most times he prefers the grace and the mercy. Our other motivation, I think, ultimately, is to live our life worthy of the gospel so that we don't disappoint the Lord. I think reverence has an awful lot to do with that. We look at who God is, our creator. We look at how high and how majestic and how wonderful and how beautiful he is and how much he's done for us and how much he loves us. And out of that love, we ultimately want to do things for him so that we don't disappoint him. We don't want to fail up to live to the, to the full privileges, all the benefits that we have received from Christ being on the cross. We don't want to belittle those benefits. Therefore, with fear and trembling, we work out our salvation. In other words, we try to become more like Christ in our daily walk in our life. Nobody's in charge of your own spiritual well-being. You are. Nobody else is. Not a single soul. Nobody can help. They can help you. They can guide you. They can lead you. A pastor can help you. A Sunday school teacher can help you. A mentor can help you get to where you've got to be to get closer to Jesus. But in the end, you must do the work. You must be the one who says, Lord Jesus Christ, mold me, shape me, change me. I faithfully, obediently bow my knee to you, Lord. May you start making me more like you. Only the Lord can change you in the end, but you must put the effort into it. So that's the first thing that Paul's saying when he says, work out your salvation with fear and troubling. But there's a second component to this, and I, I believe it's very true. I think it has a corporate uh, component to it. In other words, a church component. Until the day of the Lord comes, I think every knee is going to bow someday. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We found that in the hymn. Uh, chapter 2, verses 10 to 11 specifically talks about this bowing of everybody, whether that might be demons, whether that might be the devil, whether that might be angels. Everyone's going to bow to the Lord one day. The church at Philippi are to imitate Christ. The others focused. In other words, they're supposed to be focused on the well-being of other people, their humble servanthood, their obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain, who gave his life a ransom for many, is an example of what Paul's talking about. If you're going to work out your salvation, make sure within the confines of the church that you're supporting each other, building each other up in the faith, loving one another. And this is incredibly important for Paul. Seek unity with each other. In the presence of the Lord, one day you'll give an account. Rebuild the social harmony and unity inside of the church then. Flee from selfishness, vain conceit. That happens in the churches all the time. When people are sitting back saying, you know what? It's all about me. I want to get my way. I want to be the one who tells the direction of the church. I want to be the one who has all the control and all the power. We've met people like that in churches everywhere. And this is what Paul's saying. You've got to give that up. You've got to put that aside because working out your salvation with fear and trembling is to remember the Lord is the head of the church. You are not. It's the Lord. And whatever the Lord wants, you want to bow your knee to him. And the number one thing that he wants, amongst many other things, he wants unity. He wants you to get along with other people. In other words, you've got to value their interest above that of your own, Paul says. Make sure you do that with fear and trembling, realizing that the Lord is in charge of you. We've got to value others above ourselves. Can you imagine what a church would look like if everybody did that? There wouldn't be any fights. There wouldn't be any disputes. We'd be tripping over each other, trying to do good deeds to one another because we love each other so very much and we love the Lord. Now, is this all possible? Sounds really good, doesn't it, by the way? Both working out your salvation individually and coming closer to God and bowing your knee to him. And it also sounds really good, the church being fully united and everybody loving each other and supporting one another. Is this possible? Paul says, no, it is not possible based on human effort alone. It cannot be done. 
Paul realizes that. He realized what he's asking of the Philippian church is something that cannot be done by human standards in any way, shape, or form. Can't be done. However, Paul says this, salvation was beyond human ability. We could not become saved without Jesus Christ getting on that cross and dying for our sins. Without his atonement, we cannot get saved. Our belief in him in his atoning sacrifice is how we get saved, but it's a gift specifically from Christ. And I got thinking, the same is also true about our spiritual maturity, both individually and within the church. It is not possible based on our own efforts. On our own efforts, we're going to go back to our old selfish people. We're going to go back to our own ways. We're going to follow the broad path. We're going to go back and we're going to say, you know what, I want to fight with people inside of the church because that's what our our human nature or our sinful nature, that's what our sinful nature really wants. It's only possible for us to actually fulfill this command by asking God for help. Paul says this, God works in you to will and to act. Think about that. God works in you and in me and all of us first to get the will to want to grow and become more like Christ and to get the will to want to get along with everybody inside the church. And God will act within your life and tell you exactly what you need to do and give you the power to do it in order to accomplish it. What do we have to do then? We have to obey. We have to say, when the Lord says, here's my will, here's what I want you to do, we've got to say, yes, Lord, I will do it. And that's our role. God doesn't give us a, a, he doesn't override our free will. In other words, what I'm trying to say, he doesn't take away our free will. We always have the right to do anything that we want, Paul says, but not everything's beneficial. Paul says, you have the right to do anything you want, but I won't be enslaved by anything that's out there. And I think that's the same with us. We have the right to do anything that we want, but we must bow our knee to Christ if we are going to become more spiritually mature and be a unified body of Christ. Now let's think about this. Are you praying and striving for growth in humility, personal holiness, as a selfless service, sacrificial uh, 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 mission by the power of God Almighty? Are you trying to do it on your own efforts? Do you live your life with the realization that one day every believer will be required to give an account of what things they've done in the body, whether good or bad? Do you live that way? Do you realize that every single word, thought, deed, every single one of them, you'll give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what that's going to be like? When you are overwhelmed with habitual sins, do you remind yourself that the devil is tempting you, that God's divine, and God will help you overcome those sins If you bow your knee to him and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I need help. So working out our salvation with both fear and trembling, it's only possible through God, through his help, his divine might. But remember, it's possible. When we say yes to the Lord, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We're going to become more mature in the faith. It's going to happen. So we just got to say, I'm all in. I like this little cartoon. It says here, are you complaining again? Do you realize that you spend all your time complaining? And then, of course, Lucy says, why shouldn't I complain? Have you seen my life? Can Can you see how hard it is? How difficult it is? Surely I should complain. If not me, who? Have you ever felt that way? I'm sure we all have felt that way from time to time. Paul says this, do everything Everything. He doesn't say to just do some things. He doesn't say that there's certain circumstances that you can do, cannot complain to or argue about. He says in all things, in everything that you do on the face of this planet, do it without complaining or arguing. This is what Paul says. In other words, it's a sin to complain or to argue. Again, it's not a sin to seek comfort from another Christian and say, I want you to help me through the power of the Holy Spirit figure out what's going on in my life, and I really need the help of the Lord in order to get closer to him and survive what I'm going through. That's not sinful. We should seek the comfort. It says in the Bible, the comfort that we receive from God the Father in heaven, we should take that same comfort and pass it on to each other. But that's, what not, that's not what Paul's saying. He says, when we complain, When we bitter like Lucy, why shouldn't I complain about my circumstances to everybody that I meet? Because of so many reasons. Most importantly, it really breaks down our witness. Let's look at this command. In working out their salvation, Paul says this. I want you to do everything without arguing or complaining. You know, if we look at the Greek language, Paul points to this. 
He says, taking instructions for the church from the narrative of Israel is what he's looking at here. He went back to Israel and he said, you know what? What happened in Israel? When they were in the wilderness, what did they do? They complained and they argued with each other. And they complained bitterly over their circumstances, even though God was taking care of them. They didn't like the way God was doing it. And as a result of that, they complained over and over again, quite bitterly to the Lord, both in Exodus 15, 17 and Numbers 14 to 17. Paul's allusion, though, to this is not a direct one, but at the same time, it gives us a glimpse. Does God like a complaining heart? No. Definitely not. Does God see a complaining heart, a bitter heart, a heart that's not happy with the circumstances and bitterly complains to everybody? Is he okay with that? Is that a sin? It is definitely a sin, and he's not okay with that whatsoever. You know, we're not even told what the Philippians were complaining about. We weren't. But we can, if we go through his entire letter, we can roughly figure out what probably they were complaining about in the first place. Paul just finished saying, you've got to live your life worthy of the gospel message. This meant putting away selfish ambition, vain conceit, and with a humble desire, putting other people first. In this context, grumbling likely meant that a whole bunch of them were whispering. They were giving complaints to each other. They were talking in secret about each other behind each other's back. Arguing likely meant they quarreled, they debated in the ways that were divisive and raised doubts with inside the church. They were probably feeling the pinch of persecution because they were being persecuted by 18 different groups, at least, as we learned earlier. And on top of that, they're being persecuted within the church itself with some really bad leadership. So they're really wrestling with, how do I actually put a smile on my face and my circumstances? Like the wilderness episodes, complaints were likely made by the Philippians, most likely against their leadership. Some of the leadership, it would have been justified. Some of them were not very good leaders. But at the same time, the majority were good leaders. But some of their complaints might have been focused at Paul himself. Because they might have been saying, you know what, Paul? You're in a Roman prison. And a lot of this heat that we're feeling is because you're in that prison. We're being persecuted even more by the Romans here within Philippi. The reason for complaining and arguing, why is it considered a sin by God? Sins against God for three reasons, I think. So if you argue and you complain and you're talking about your circumstances very negatively to anybody that you'll meet, and you're not happy with your life and the way it's going, why is that a sin? First, it breeds disunity within the body of Christ. The more people complain about the way things are going inside of the church, instead of seeking the Lord's help in order to make things better, the more it's going to create disunity within the church because people are going to complain about everything. The things that you like, the next person's not going to like. And as a result of that, you're going to complain, and then you're going to start arguing with one another who has the right means, who has the right path in the first place. Secondly, speaking poorly about our circumstances shows that we do not trust God. It means that we sit back and we look at a sovereign God and say, I'm not happy with the circumstances you're allowing me to go through. I know you're sovereign over all things seen and unseen, Colossians 1.16, but I'm not happy with what you've given me specifically. As a result of that, I'm complaining, but in reality, I'm complaining against you, God, because you didn't give me the circumstances that I wanted. And finally, it's a sin because it produces a really bad witness. When the unbeliever sees God's people complaining and arguing, and they're bitter about life circumstances, it's very hard to tell the world, oh, by the way, I love Jesus with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he is a source of my unspeakable joy. And then at the same time, we're arguing like Lucy saying, shouldn't I complain? Have you seen my life? Of course, when we do that, it shows the world that we don't have anything better than what they have. In reality, we have Christ. We have someone so much better than what they have. But how will they ever know if we're always arguing and complaining? We've got to keep our eyes fixed, I think, on our eternal home. And I think this is important. Living a life worthy of the gospel message is certainly not easy. Pursuing holiness, giving generously, practicing hospitality, looking out for the interests of others. You know, when things go beyond our ability to handle, when things become incredibly negative, it becomes very easy to complain or to murmur. We know the Israelite people in the wilderness, and they had Moses as a leader, and they still complained and they still argued with each other. The same is true today. The more difficult our circumstances become, the more easy it is, I think, to complain, to argue, and to see our life as becoming really bad. And we forget about all the blessings that we have. Though complaining is often, I think, the language of our culture today. 
May we not lose sight of our greater exodus. May we not lose sight of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came and died for us and rose again. We may we not lose sight that we have just one mile to go. In other words, our lives are incredibly short. We're like vapor in the wind, the Bible says. We're here today and gone tomorrow. May we remember that ultimately, yes, we may suffer for a season, but one day we're going to be with the Lord. And when we do, our suffering will seem minor compared to the glory that we have received. May we understand that and take that to heart. Suffering is momentary compared to the glory of heaven. And may we run the race to win the prize. And the prize is God's wonderful and beautiful embrace. Can you imagine the day that we actually get to heaven? And, and, you know, God comes up to us as our father and gives us a great big old hug and says, welcome home. That's got to be something absolutely staggering for us. I got thinking about this. Complaining is speaking and dwelling on our current circumstances in a negative way that doesn't reflect on the grace and the blessings that we've received from the Lord. When you face trials and tribulations, do you complain vigorously? Are you able to see beyond your circumstances and to realize that you have eternity in the Lord and therefore you rejoice? Which is it? Are you able to see, you know, the forest, you know, the f- big picture that you're going to heaven? Or are you just looking at the one single tree in front of you that's giving you grief? Which is it? Do you say bad things about people when they're not present? Do you find it's very easy to complain to them and say, you know what, my circumstances are because this person doesn't treat me very well? Because often that's what complaining leads to. Do you find yourself arguing with people about your circumstances or where the church should go? All of these things are sin before God. Paul goes on and says this. If you can do this, and he realizes it's a tall order, and he realizes that working out your salvation with fear and trembling, not complaining and not arguing, he fully realizes that no human being can do that on their own, and he fully realizes that without divine might and power, it will never happen. But with God's help, it's a guarantee. He says this, if you can do this, if you can rely on God, if you can actually have faith in him and say, yes, Lord, I'm all in, whatever your will is, I'm in. Whatever you want me to do, I'm in. And when it comes to negative things in my life, I'm going to praise you anyway because you are my God. And I know I'm only going to be here for a short season anyway. So I praise you, Lord God. I praise you with all my heart. If you're able to do this, Paul says this, so that you might become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then, if you are able to do this, you will shine like stars in the sky, and you will firmly hold on to the word of truth, the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in labor or in vain. Blameless and pure is one of the things that we receive when we don't complain and we don't argue. Three beautiful promises, though, in the end that Paul gives to us. He says this blamelessness. I love this. When the world sees you, they won't be able to blame you. They won't be able to look at you and say, you're no different than I am. You complain and you are just as bitter about your life circumstances that I am. Therefore, since you're the same as I am, what do you have to offer? The world won't be able to blame you. They won't be able to sit back and say, you're the same as I am. Because you're not going to be the same. You're going to be rejoicing in the most difficult of times because you have God beside you and God within you. You know what? God liberated all of them, all of the Philippians. He's liberated all of us to do his will. He energizes us through the Holy Spirit and gives us the ability to serve him. So despite our negative circumstances, we can sit back and say, thank you, Lord. I can be holy as you are holy. I may have difficult times. I don't have to like them, but I certainly have to have the right context. I've got to think about them in the right way. In other words, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the blessings that you give me, because that one minor negative circumstance is just that. It's minor compared to what I've gotten already. I'm a born-again believer. I am a child of God. That's got to be an amen. It's just got to be. The surrounding culture of Rome prided itself on language that was morally bent, twisted, unscrupulous, dishonest. And usually the Roman culture loved to attack and degrade other people because when they went through negative circumstances, they like to poke at others and say, you know what, your life's far worse than mine. You ever do that? Your life's worse than mine is, therefore I'm going to rejoice in my little petty problems that I have. Even that's a bad attitude, isn't it? We shouldn't take comfort in other people's misery if it's worse than our own. But people do that. They did it in the Roman times. Paul had to address it. They still do it today. 
When the Philippians imitated such negative language, they lost their saltiness. In other words, Jesus said, you are the salt of this earth. You bring flavor to the world. And he says, the moment that you start acting like the world, you're no longer salty. You're no longer a light to the world. You're no longer different than them. You're acting just like them. The reality is our words are no longer distinct. They're no longer the holy ones that come from God the Father in heaven. And therefore, people don't see us as Christians. I often wonder if if Caesar... Way back in the Roman times, he actually wanted people executed for being Christians. If Caesar came up and said, you know what, are you a Christian? Would he have to ask that question? I like to think for myself, he he wouldn't have to ask. All he would say is, I know you're a Christian because I see the way you act and the way you walk and the way you talk. And I know you're a Christian. Therefore, you know what, I have an issue with you. But what about your life? Would Caesar have to ask the question even? Would Caesar sit back and say, I'm not sure if you're a Christian or not because I can't see any difference in you. Would he have an issue with you? Do you act different than this world? Do you act in accordance with God's rules and regulations? Do you do God's will and live for him? Because if you do, you are definitely going to be different than this world. Paul says this, if you're, gonna, if you're able to stop complaining and stop arguing, then you will be like the stars in the sky. You will shine like stars as you hold firmly onto the, the word of life itself. This is an allusion to Daniel 12, 3. The Philippians were in the resurrection age, in other words. Those who are wise will be those who shine brightly within the sky and all people can see them. Philippians can only stand firm in one spirit, not be frightened by persecution, shine like stars amongst this warped and crooked generation, if and only if they'll grasp and hang on to God's holy word that teaches them how to live good and holy lives. In other words, it's not just God that helps us to get the will and the act, but God's given us his holy word, a beautiful love letter to us that we're supposed to be reading, memorizing, understanding, but more importantly, we're supposed to live that word. And Paul says, hang on, grasp that word of life and make sure you're living it. By living and defending the word of God, the Philippians will not be known as grumbling and a complaining church. They'll be known as a proclaiming church. And that's what they want to be seen as. Their light, their lives will be so filled with God's holy word. And their actions and their words and deeds will reflect God so much so that they will shine within their community. Like a star within a dark sky, they will shine very brightly. They will show that they are purchased and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And and you know what? This is going to make a big difference within their community. Their words will actually reflect what God would say if he was here in the flesh, if Christ was here in the flesh, that is. If he was here in the flesh right now, their words would be the same. They would be very similar. Why? Because they're in tune with God's will and they're always doing it. And they're always speaking the way that he wants. They will also get this, and I love this part. Paul says, I will get to boast on the day of the Lord if you could just stop complaining and arguing. Not only let your light shine, but also, he says, I love that part, Paul says, you're my partner, he says in the gospel message. And he says, but I also want you to be realizing all the time that on the day of Christ's return, that you're, I'm going to boast because you are going to shine so very brightly. The Philippians could exert themselves physically, mentally, spiritually. They could work hard. They could toil, strive, and they could struggle. But in the end, Paul says, I want you to rely on the Lord at all times, regardless of whether you're going through good or bad circumstances. Paul told the Philippians, he said, I'm not going to boast in myself. I'm always going to boast in the Lord. So whatever I go through, whatever I accomplish in life, Paul says, I give God the Father in heaven all the glory and all the honor. So when I go through bad times, I tell the world that, hey, God's holding me up. I have so many blessings. Let me tell you about some of those. And Paul says, when you're going through good times, tell them all about how great and awesome God is and all the good things he's given to you. Either circumstances, make sure you tell them God is good. Make sure you tell them that because that's incredibly important. The language that we use when we speak to others, I think, matters a great deal when it comes to letting our light shine unto this world. If you could see Christ standing right beside you this very day and all days, which of course he is, but we don't physically see him. But if you could, what would he say about your words? 
Would he say the righteous and true? Would he say good and faithful servant? You you talk just like me. You have my mind anyway, since we have the mind of Christ. You're talking just like me, good and faithful servant. Or would he say, whoa, you shouldn't be saying those things. That's the way the world talks. From what Paul says to the Philippians, can you see how important it is to not complain or argue or dispute or go through any negativity and share that negativity with the world when we go through trials and tribulations? Can you see the value in us seeing the forest, the whole forest and not the single tree that's annoying us? We've got to tell the world that we're deeply in love with God, no matter what happens to us. We're deeply in love with him. And Paul says this. This is really important. I rejoice in the Lord always. Paul's trying to say through his death. He's trying to say, if you're going to think about my death, and should I die, Paul says, I want you to be rejoicing in the Lord, whether I live or whether I die. Either way, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad. And I rejoice with all you. So too, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Verse 17 and 18. Paul hoped for a favorable verdict. He was hoping while he's in this prison. you got to imagine, Paul, here he is. He's got a guard that's literally chained to him 24-7. And every few hours, a new guard would be coming to relieve the last guard. And a new, fresh guard, of course, shows up. And he's chained there just to make sure Paul can't get free. Paul has no privacy whatsoever. Paul realizes that most likely when he gets in front of Caesar, there's a good possibility that Caesar's not going to like what he has to say because it's talking. he's going to talk about the Lord, and as a result of that, Caesar's going to have him executed. And Paul says, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, even if there's a very strong possibility that I am going to die, he says, I am glad. I will rejoice. I will rejoice in my circumstances. How could Paul say that? He's in one of the most negative, dire circumstances one could ever imagine. And yet he says, I am glad and I will rejoice. Where does Paul get this from? Paul gives us a sacrificial image here. He says there's a common practice back in ancient culture of, you know, doing a sacrifice. And after the sacrifice was done, there would be a, a thing of wine often or sometimes water, and it would be either poured at the base of the altar or poured on the altar itself as the final part of the sacrifice. Paul says, my entire life has been a sacrifice ultimately unto the Lord. And I got thinking about that. That's certainly true for Paul. Hopefully it's true for all of us. Paul said this, I have five times received 40 lashes minus one, three times beaten with rods and shipwreck, once pelted with stones, danger from bandits, Gentiles, and Jews, all of them seeking my life. Now I'm in prison 24-7, chained to a guard, facing likely execution. And then he says, oh, by the way, I am so incredibly glad, filled with joy, unspeakable joy. Why? Why would he feel this way? And Paul says this, he says, because Christ emptied himself and he was humble and obedient. He went to a cross and he died. If God wants me to be executed for Christ's name's sake, I am all in. I'm here. I am willing and I'm rejoicing. This is what he's saying, because I get to walk in the steps of Christ himself and I rejoice with all of my heart. That's tough, isn't it? That's tough preaching. That's tough news. But I think we got to get there. We got to have the right attitude. Got to have the right attitude. If executed, the Philippians were supposed to make his joy complete. Though so through their obedience and their steadfastness in living their lives worthy of the gospel message. So Paul says, first and foremost, if they do execute me, Paul says, I want you as a church to continue loving the Lord and living for the Lord. Do not blame the Lord. I, Paul ultimately chose this. Paul had the option. The Holy Spirit warned him. If you go towards Jerusalem, if you go back that way, you know what's going to happen to you is you're going to die there. And Paul said, I've been warned by the Holy Spirit long time ago what I was waiting me, what was going to happen to me. Actually, if we go back a little bit further, when Paul was first called into ministry, he was told the same thing. You know what God told him, Christ told him, you know, he said, yeah, I'm going to show you, Paul, how much you're going to have to suffer for my name's sake. Are you willing to do the ministry? And Paul said, yes. Paul said, yes, all of his life, regardless of the poor circumstances. You know what? He was seeking. He's told the Philippians, seek unity with each other. Seek, hold firmly onto and proclaim the word of God to this warped and this crooked generation. 
Despite the internal and external hardships, holding on to living and proclaiming the word of God was to be their number one focus and never stop doing it. Paul's death, he said, I don't see it as a point of sorrow or lost hope. He says, I will be with Christ the moment they take my physical life from me. I'm going to have a beautiful life in the Lord, and I'm rejoicing. And Paul says, if you can do these things, if you can imitate Christ in his humble service, then guess what? When I get there, and I'm accountable before the judgment seat of Christ, and he says, I'm going to hold you accountable for things done in the body, whether good or bad, Paul says, I'm going to rejoice because I know my labor was not in vain because you're living for Jesus. You're living for him. And Paul says, I really love that thought. I'm rejoicing. How easy it is for us to get our eyes fixed on the concerns of this world. How much time do you spend seeking to know, understand, and are you willing to obey God's will? Are you willing to set aside your own goals if God asks you to do so? And even if he asks you, like he did Apostle Paul, to do some things in his name that might be really difficult, might even have some negative circumstances, are you willing to do so without complaining and arguing? When you feel like you're being poured out like a drink offering, are you also rejoicing in the Lord because you're serving him? You're walking in his footsteps. Do you feel the joy? Do you feel it? This is what Paul wants us to feel. He wants us to run the race. In other words, he wants us to finish well. Are you running that race? Are you ready to finish well? Yes, there is a right way and a wrong way to handle conflict in our life. There's a right way and a wrong way to handle negative circumstances that always come our way. Absolutely, of course there is. The conflict that we often feel, though, is that we have our wills, we have our desires, our goals, our dreams, and often that's in conflict with what God wants us to do within our lives. So yes, is there a wrong way to handle this kind of tension that we always feel between our will and God's will? Is there a right and wrong way to handle this conflict? Absolutely. Paul says, ultimately, yes, you can describe your negative circumstances to somebody else to seek comfort, another believer. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with asking them, how do I get through this? How do I get the strength and the courage and the love and the unspeakable joy? How do I get the right focus, realizing I got one mile left to go to get to heaven? There's nothing wrong with seeking comfort from each other. Definitely not. The Bible tells us to do so. What Paul says is wrong, though, is when we go out and we negatively complain and we tell everybody about our bad circumstances because we're angry and bitter because we think we got better things coming to us in our lives than what God's given to us. Believers are called to work out their salvation. While holiness is beyond any human ability, not only, but it's not only possible, but it's a reality. Paul says you can run the race, you can finish well, if you realize that God gives you the will and the power to act in accordance with his wonderful and beautiful holy word. When faced with negative circumstances, God doesn't want us to whisper complaints because it often leads to a critical heart, spreading negativity and arguments amongst his holy people. Also, it shows a lack of trust in a sovereign God. It shows that one's not satisfied with God's providential care over our lives. It testifies to the world, ultimately, that we're nothing distinct. In other words, we're no different than what they are. But we are different than them. It takes away our saltiness and makes us look like and appear to be like chameleons within a world that is crooked. And Paul calls it a crooked generation. And that's what we appear to be to this world. As believers don't want to be known as complaining and arguing, but proclaiming the only way that's going to happen is if we have the right attitude. There should not be conflict between our will and God's will. It should only be God's will. We should embrace his will for our lives, whether it is to go through good times or whether it's to go through bad times. Either way, we should embrace him and say, thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you have for me, you will give me the strength and the courage to endure it. And you will also give me the wonderful and beautiful witness of going through difficult times and saying, Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. I still love you. I still love you because you're still taking care of me, even in the difficult times. I still love you because I just got a mile to go and I'm about to go to heaven anyway. I still love you because I'm a redeemed masterpiece of your grace. I still love you because I'm born again. I still love you because you first loved me and still do. This is our attitude that we're supposed to have. 
Let the word of God mold you, shape you, change your words, thoughts, and actions. May you give this world the glorious message that you're deeply in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And despite your circumstances, you're not going to stop loving him. Don't tell the world through your negativity and your complaints that you're not loving the Lord anymore because that's what they think when they hear it. Instead, tell them, I love Jesus. Show them how much you love Jesus by trusting him and living for him and loving him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And tell the world how great he is, especially in the most difficult times. One of the very best witnesses we can give to the world is trusting the Lord when they would not. You see, they would trust the Lord as long as the Lord always gave them blessings. But the second they got to go through difficult times, the world doesn't trust the Lord at all. They actually look at him and say, I want nothing to do with you. You have to be the opposite. You have to say, I trust the Lord despite my circumstances, because in the end, what the Lord has given me is far greater and far better than anything that could ever happen to me in this world. So tell them, tell the world, you love God. And you love the people that God has put in your life with all of your heart. And you're not going to complain because you're so deeply in love with him that the things of this world, the negative things that happen to us, you still don't like them. But at the same time, they're minor in comparison to the glory that you already have in Christ and the glory that you're about to receive when you go home to be with him. Tell the world how much you love Jesus. Tell them and stop complaining and arguing. Amen and amen.